some uh, speaker, <laughs> which is much harder, <laughs> rather than chair. So I've got a slide or two. There we are. I'm intending to only speak for um, presentation on press A, yeah. Which one do I press next? Is that the start? Yeah, hey, hey. Um, so I, I intend to only, I'm trying to get eye contact there, uh, speak for about 10 minutes because I'm interested in knowing your opinions, not, not mine, because I already know my opinions. <laughs> so, they're of no interest to me. So I want to basically talk about distributive justice in the information age. And my basic thesis is that we need to think of information as a currency of distributive justice. You know, when we think about distributive justice, we think about money, or we might think about political rights, but we hardly ever think about information. And it seems to me that we can't keep doing that. It's, uh, it's no longer tenable. So, I've got five slides, and it's up on the screen. I know you can all read. <laughs> I'm not going to read them out. Um, and, first of all, information as a distribuendum. How many of you are professional political philosophers? How many of you are professional political philosophers? Yes, but yeah, I, I'm kind of half one as well. So, uh, you're probably sociologists and all the rest. Um, and basically everyone has always needed information, you know, so I know we're talking about digital society, but in the Stone Age you needed information to survive. And I've got a famous quote there from Norbert Wiener, who was the founder of cybernetics. And of course we're not talking about all information, we're talking about some information. We're talking about vital information, like political information accurate political information, we're talking about health information, we're talking about, I think, financial information, of which most people are completely ignorant, legal information, and so on. And that's always been the case. But in digital society, it, even more so must information become a preoccupation, a focus of thinking about distributive justice. Um, I had a paper published, for those of you who are interested, last year in the European Journal of Social Theory, entitled Castells versus Bell, which is free online, it's open access, you might want to download that. And I basically argued that Castells and Bell, who are the two leading English language, at any rate, writers on the information age, if you combine the best of their ideas, you get quite a convincing case that we have social scientific case that we have moved out of the industrial era into the post-industrial era. I know a lot of politicians talk about the information age and journalists do, but you know, I think it has been established social scientifically insofar as one can establish a thesis social scientifically. So, you know, we're in the information age. It's almost to me an analytical truth that we need to treat information as a, an object of descriptive justice. And even more so, given the, the bad stuff, the, which some of the earlier speakers have talked about, you know, algorithmic bias, disinformation, chaos, hyper-ignorance, and all the rest, fake news. These make it urgent that we think about how we get the right information to people. So the task has become important. And I'm a Rawlsian. I think with John Rawls, I found John Rawls. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I agree with G.A. Cohen, who said that there are at most two books in the history of Western political philosophy that are greater, that can claim to be greater than Rawls's A Theory of Justice, and they are, any guesses? Well, he said Plato's Republic and Hobbes's Leviathan. And I also agree, agree with Robert Nozick, who said that his work, Rawls's theory of justice is so important that political philosophers should either work within it or give a very good reason why not. So I work with Rawls, and Rawls has a, an, at the centre of his theory 
is a theory of social primary goods. And these are goods that any rational person can be presumed to want, whatever else they want. In other words, these are goods which are neutral as to ends. And the essence of Rawls's position is that it's non-teleological. It's, um, it's a liberal theory of justice, so it's not dependent on a comprehensive view of the good, and in religious or otherwise, and imposing that on society. He says that's unjust. It's based on a thin theory of the good. And his, he has a basket of primary goods, famously, and they are liberties, rights, opportunities, offices, money, and what he calls the social basis of self-respect. But he doesn't mention information. Now, he grounds these, these, this list of social primary goods, which he says we all want, whatever our ultimate conception of the good is, we all want these worldly goods, um, into, not in empiricism, not in, you know, oh, what are your top, top five goods? No, he grounds it, or tries to, in a deontological, and in fact Kantian position, and he argues that we have two moral powers, all of us. First of all, the capacity for a sense of justice, or the capacity to be reasonable, and secondly, a capacity to conceive and ca carry out a rational plan of life. So it's almost, he's saying that synthetic a priori. It's quite interesting that he should do that. It's a deontological position at any rate. And I would put it to you, ladies and gentlemen, that information is a social primary good. It is neutral as regards ends, and it should be there on his list. Rawls was open about his list, and he later entertained the possibility of leisure being added to it and one or two other goods. So why not information? Well, I think he should have put information in, and indeed, I think his theory is weakened by the fact that it wasn't, and that's quite a bold thing to say, given Rawls' stature. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm saying it. And I think Rawls should have thought about a neutral concept we all have. It's central, it's implicit to all our thinking about democracy and democratic equality, which is the idea of a well-informed citizen, which is neutral as regards ends, but it's part of how we understand democracy. So I think if you inject this character into Rawls' theory, you strengthen his theory of liberal justice. Now, Rawls has two principles, famously. <clears throat> and the first one is things, social primary goods, that have to be distributed exactly equally. For example, one person, one vote. You know, it's not two votes for that intelligent chap there. <laughs> one vote for me, <laughs> being less intelligent. <laughs> uh, he wanted, well, it's, it's a, you know, a tenet of liberal democracy. One person, one vote. Exact equality before the law. We're talking about arithmetic equality. Uh, and then he says other social primary goods can fall under the second principle, which he famously called the difference principle. And this allows inequalities so long as they work to the benefit of the whole society and particularly the worst off. And he makes quite a strong position for that, that you don't want an equality of misery. If you build in incentives... We can all gain, the cake gets bigger, so long as you maximise the position of the worst off. But famous difference principle. Well, I would put it to you that information belongs firmly under the first principle. Some information Rawlsians, I'm not the only one, <laughs> um, think that it can go under the second principle. I don't think that's right. I think it has to be treated exactly equally. So, basically, um, in, that's... that's what I'm saying, that information has to be distributed exactly equally um, in a Rawlsian conception of social and distributive justice. And, you know, talking about, he said at one point, self-respect is perhaps the most important good. He didn't tease that out a lot, but surely to, be, to have self-respect as, you know, as a citizen is to be well-informed. That's what a self-respecting citizen is. They're a well-informed citizen. Just as you need information to, you know, to exercise a sense of justice. And just as you need information to have a rational plan of life. I mean, for example, you need careers information. You know, information is almost constitutive 
of having a rational plan of life. So it is the basis, I put it, or a basis of self-respect. So I think Rawls is, which is, I think, the strongest theory of distributive justice out there. I think information can be naturally plugged into it, and we get a sort of neo-Rawlsian account of distributive justice. And I'm not going into these, but of course, those of you who have political philosophy in your um, locker, there have been post in theories trying to overturn rules, and that, that's a list of some of them. I'll just mention one. Lucky egalitarianism says that it doesn't matter if outcomes are unequal so long as they're the result of your bad behaviour. So if we gave everyone in this room, you know, a thousand euros and tomorrow someone's got 10,000 and someone else got none, that's not a problem for lucky egalitarianism. Now, I think that is wrong for information because our, it seems to me that our intuitions are in favour of rationing of information. For example, say there's a war, you know, Mussolini or some other idiot um, <laughs> starts flying planes over us. Um, we have an air raid siren. We would expect that air raid siren to sound as loudly in the poor areas as in the rich areas and as early in the poor areas. We have an instinct of absolutely equal information. During the pandemic, which someone mentioned, it's not the case that we thought, oh, some communities, you know, they, they don't care about COVID, so we don't need to give them vaccine information. No, we wanted exactly equal packages of vaccine information, vital information, to go to everyone in society. So I don't think lucky egalitarianism can work for a theory of distributive justice in information. And finally, the bit you've all been waiting for, <laughs> what, what about the practicalities? Well, answers on a postcard, please. <laughs> um, all, all I will, you know, how do we actually bring the right information to people in this age of disinformation, misinformation, information. That's a very difficult question. Um, I think it's important to establish the philosophical case for distributive justice in information and indeed arithmetic equality in, in information. Um, but then you've got to work out how we would do this. And all I would say is uh, some information rules unions have said, oh, we need an epistemic basic structure because rules said the basic structure is the subject of social justice. The social institutions are the major social institutions. So some information rules have said, look, we need to set up an epistemic basic structure. That's dualism. No, it's not the case that tourism information centres and libraries are epistemic and hospitals and factories aren't. They're equally informational. You know, so it, we, there's not a separate epistemic basic structure. We need the whole basic structure to be informatized and to be brought within the concern of, of social justice and information. So there you have it, folks. Um, I hope I've spoken. I've probably got a few minutes for questions. That's why I came to conference. So don't disappoint me. <laughs> So, the, yeah. Thank you so much for that. Okay. Good, good. A couple of questions. Um, first of all, I totally agree with uh, you know, uh, the role of uh, institutions, especially the international institutions. And when you were talking about the, the principles of John Rawls, I was thinking of the, um, the, the community who could not be identified in the digital system, so to say, like the elderly. For example, if you want to um, give equal rights and equal information to the people here, you will discriminate by the very uh, system, the, the digital system. So how to reach those people, yeah. for example. And my second question is um, about, yeah, that um, global distribution because... Oh, do you mind I'm recording you? No. D so that I can learn later. Does anyone mind? No, okay. I don't want to violate your prison rights. Go on. <laughs> yeah, um, the second question is that um, the issue that you're um, touching upon, upon is global. 
Yeah. And as far as I know, John Rawls um, is like he talks especially about the the, um, the injustice and the uh, distribution and the in a, on a state basis. And especially in his book Law of Peoples, he says explicitly that he um, yeah he's interested in the in the state, but not on a global uh, level. So how would you? Um, apply Rawls's um, so to say method in yeah in a more so to say cosmopolitan um, world. Well, thank you. These are great questions. First one, yeah, you've been. Who are the digital poor now? It used to be women. It used to be people of colour. It's not now. You know, women are online as much as men. It, it is the very elderly. Um, they are the new digitally damned, and they're the ones who are struggling. And so, yeah, there, there's a big issue about how you get information to them. And you know, most apps are create, created. I mean, I, I work for a startup called ProfessorMe.com. I've got a plug in there. Uh, and you know, there's no way an older person could engage with it. You know, it's it's for younger people. Uh, I, I worry a lot about that, actually. Um, and I think I think they're being discriminated against. I think it's terrible for them. You know, this whole machine age, you know. So that's good, problematic. Um, yeah, you're absolutely right. Rawls's theory of justice is about one society. Um, and then later in his life, he wrote a book called Law of Peoples, where he's talking about a liberal international order, which includes what he calls decent hierarchical peoples that aren't democratic, um, and he says there's no global basic structure. So he, he can't, you can't apply his principles of justice to the globe, global scene. Um, for example, the difference principle, maximise the per position of the worst off, which would mean basically emptying America of its wealth and <laughs> giving it to Bangladesh, <laughs> or whatever. So, yeah, he has a sort of yeah, more lenient view, you know, he says there should be minimum standards, but he's, you, know, you can't apply maximum globally. Um, it's impractical. Um, so, yeah, it's so, when, for all Rawlsians, I think, you, you worry about how it applies at the global level. Um, but thank you for that. This, I, think, I, think, I think you were next, actually. Could be... Didn't you stick your hand up first? Yeah. Oh, oh, no, no, oh, oh you didn't? Okay. Oh, oh, sorry. I beg your pardon. Thank you for the presentation. So I heard going, uh, first of all, information is a uh, social primary group, yes. In, you agree? In, yeah. I, Good. I think in, yeah, in, your, in your two cents, yeah. maybe. But today, there's too much information. It's an uphill struggle, but you know it's it's a normative ideal, and you know there are initiatives to. I mean, you were touching on some at the end of your presentation. Um, you know, the, there must be initiatives to combat f falsehood. There must be initiatives to popularize complex information. So you know, it's the roles of social institutions like libraries, um, universities, schools. The whole movement for digital literacy and so on. And, you know, it's difficult, yeah. But, but you know, we have to have an ideal. Or without an ideal, we've no target to aim at. And so the world is, is chaotic. Um, so I think it's useful to have a, an account of distributive justice and in information and then make sure governments and other actors try to implement it. I think it involve, I think it will involve the role of the state, you know, 
I think the state needs to get involved in getting accurate information to people and, and stopping inaccurate information. So, yeah, thank you. Um, I think I've probably had enough of, uh, you know, my time. So unless I, someone's got an urgent question. Do you mind if I take a photo of you? Um, I have written books on...